Pointing in on your territory here. <laughs> um, thanks, Sarah. And uh, I, Sarah said, I'm Florencia Mallon. I teach in the history department, and it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joanna Crow, senior lecturer in the Department of Hispanic, Portuguese, and Latin American Studies at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. Joe and I have been collaborating on topics of mutual interest especially Mapuche history in Chile, for some time. Uh, we are currently enjoying face-to-face -face time, and here we're very close. <laughs> um, and, we're and being able to work and to talk here in Madison thanks to a research mobility fellowship that she has received. After having done quite a bit of transnational work on Mapuche intellectuals and indigenous uh, and indigenismo in Chile, Joe is now embarked on a new project, which is the topic of her lecture today. She will be speaking to us about Chilean Peruvian intellectual encounters, <laughs> a topic little studied until recently, which places her work among those who are pioneering on the subject. So I'm very eager to hear about this, and as, as I'm sure the rest of you are, and I'll turn the podium over to you and get out of your way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I really wanted to say um, that I've really enjoyed my time here in Madison. Um, everyone has been incredibly friendly. I hope you're also friendly in questions and criticisms of the project. Um, and I'm really grateful now to have the opportunity to talk to you all today um, about my new project. It's very much a work in progress. Um, so as I said, I've, I'm very open and really do welcome comments, suggestions, questions, criticisms too. What I want to do um, is to spend about 20 minutes outlining the basic rationale for the project and where I hope or where I think I'm going to be going with the project. And then I want to spend another 15 minutes or so, hopefully, if I get my timing right, um, on one particular case study, you know, one particular moment or episode of artistic or intellectual encounter. And that's a trip that the um, indigenous Peruvian photographer Martin Chambi made to Chile in the 1930s. But back for a little while to the bigger picture. Um, academic scholarship and the popular press have tended to present the contemporary and historical relationship between Chile and Peru as one of hostile antagonism. Um, now, this is not surprising, um, given the two major wars that were fought between these countries in the 19th century and the long-term repercussions of those wars, particularly the War of the Pacific. Now, it was only a year ago or um, 15 months ago that the International Court of Justice in The Hague passed a ruling um, to hopefully settle the festering um, um, maritime border dispute between Chile and Peru. And as recently as this week, um, and it was Victor that initially passed on this information to me, as recently as this week, Peru has spoken um, of withdrawing its ambassador from Chile um, due to an intensifying um, row, no, sparked by allegations of military espionage. 
Now, the problem um, with this emphasis, um, as Stephanie Ganger says in her excellent book on antiquity collecting in Chile and Peru, um, is that we end up with an understanding of Chile and Peru as, quote, countries that have as their only connection a shared hostility. Um, Ganger's book, Relics of the Past, um, forms part of a relatively new body of scholarship, which notably includes um, two of Chile's National History Prize winners, Eduardo Cavieres and Sergio González. Um, as part of this new body of scholarship, there's begun to tease out a more entangled version you know, of the history of Chile-Peru relations. Um, that has begun to draw, um, draw out and to think about what connects and what connected the two countries as well as what separates them. Now, I hope to build on this and I hope to expand this literature with a focus on moments or instances or indeed sustained periods um, of intellectual encounter, no, of dialogue and collaboration between Chilean Peruvian intellectuals. Um, I concentrate on the first half of the 20th century, and especially in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, because I'm particularly interested in Chilean and Peruvian intellectual conversations about race and about indigenous peoples. And it is at this point that we can talk, if you like, know, of the auge or the peak of the ideology and the intellectual and political movement known as indigenismo. So that's by way of kind of explaining um, my periodization. Now, at this time, during the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, many Latin American intellectuals elaborated and promoted a collective, shared, continental American identity. And this was often positioned in direct opposition, no, to nationalism and patriotism, or at least certain forms of nationalism and patriotism. And Chilean Peruvian intellectual encounters need to be understood in this context. Victor Raúl Aire la Torre, leader of Peru's APRA party, a party with a very much a continental reach, you know, with committees and cells in many different countries across the Americas. Um, uh, Aire de la Torre, he was vitriolic in his denunciations of Peruvian patriotism, which he linked directly to class privilege. He spoke out time and time again against the Peruvian elite's anti-Chilean discourse. Um, I'll read this one. I won't read all the quotes that I have. I'll kind of speak to the quotes, and you can read them as I'm going through, partly because my Spanish pronunciation is often terrible, especially if I'm a bit nervous. Um, cada cacique, cada tirano, cada holarquía, cada clase dominante grita patriotismo. Patriotismo <laughs> significa hostilidad al vecino, odio, xenofobia, nacionalismo, provincialista y bastardo. El patriotismo en el Perú, por ejemplo, no es libertad a los cuatro millones de esclavos peruanos víctimas de la más horrible explotación feudal desde la conquista. El patriotismo es odiar a Chile. Desde que yo he nacido, desde que cada muchacho peruano nace, se le enseña a odiar a Chile. It's interesting, it's only uh, those, uh, los muchachos peruanos que they teach to hate Chile. Um, Magda Portal, um, another leader of APRA in the early years, um, spoke of an inter-americanismo and a ciudadanía continental of wanting to create this situation. And she talks about this here in a letter uh, specifically to the Chilean poet Gabriela Mistral. Mistral herself, um, despite being an employee of the Chilean state for most of her lifetime, no, most of her um, career, was in a manner more akin to Aya de la Torre um, than Magda Portal, consistently outspoken against what she saw as the very narrow-mindedness of um, nation, nationalism and patriotism. And here in a letter, this is from 1951, um, to Victoria Campo, translated into English, flag-waving and nationalism are the forces that, whose grease fattens these so-called national or patriotic movements. They live on those virtues, like on pig's lard. It's a real industry, and journalism makes itself a fortune by it. We find many similar statements um, in her letters. Now, Aya de la Torre uh, was visited Chile on numerous occasions. Magda Portal lived 
um, for five years in exile in Chile. Now, I think the theme or the reality of exile um, acts as a really useful entry point um, into a discussion of Chilean-Peruvian intellectual relations. Indeed, it strikes me as very difficult to talk about Chile-Peruvian um, relations without talking about exile. Now, there's a long tradition of Peruvian exile in Chile, um, and more so than Chilean exile in Peru, no, of which there are stories too. It's a far more prominent story, the one of um, Peruvian exiles in Chile. Um, here are just a few examples, um, going back to Manuel González Prada, who spe spent a couple of years of his adolescence um, in Chile and went to school for two years in Valparaiso. Um, the modernist poet uh, José Santos Chocano, um, who went to Chile in 1927, after being imprisoned for assassinating somebody in Peru, he was then later assassinated himself in Chile. Um, the same day of his assassination was apparently the day that Ciro Alegría arrives in Peru. Um, I'm particularly interested in these four, Luis Alberto Sanchez, Ciro Alegría, Manuel Saioni, and Magda Portal, um, all of whom were part of a very large um, APRA exile community in Chile during the 1930s and 1940s. Possibly, um, we only have very vague estimates now, but possibly um, up to 400 of the thousand or so APRA exiles from Peru were in Chile. Um, the important point for me here um, is that these four figures had a major presence in Chilean political and intellectual debates. Luis Alberto Sánchez worked at the Universidad de Chile. He was subdirector and then director of the Arcilla Publishing House. Manuel Seoni was for a while director of the Revista Arcilla. Um, Ciro Alegría worked for Arcilla también, oh, también as well. <laughs> um, in fact, so many um, Peruvians worked for Arcilla, the um, publishing house and the journal, that Luis Alberto Sanchez said at one point it was more like a Peruvian journal than it was a Chilean um, journal. Um, Ciro Alegría was also a member of the Chilean Society of Writers. Um, he was nominated for numerous literary prizes in Chile. Um, Magda Portal became a member of the Socialist Women's Organization in Chile. Um, she also ended up working for the Ministry of Education under Pedro Aguirre Cerda. In Chile. Now it was not all harmonious. Um, in these, in both these passages, uh, in both these excerpts or quotations, I think there's two stories um, being told. In the first, um, in the same letter that I quoted from before, um, between from Magda Portal to Gabriela Mistral, she says, "Nosotros vivimos bastante." bastante distanciados de los elementos intelectuales de ese país. Then talks about not distinguishing nacionalidades, pero usted conoce su tierra de hombres y mujeres fríos, lejanos. <laughs> so here, I think we have two stories in that one is of um, a lack of connection between Chilean and Peruvian intellectuals, no? but she's also talking about that lack of connection in a letter to a Chilean intellectual, Gabriela Mistral. Um, this um, excerpt here is from a pamphlet produced by um, a working class organization, Los Grupos Liber Libertarios, in 1905, um, when José Santos Chocano is um, visiting Chile. This is, so this isn't later when he's in exile in Chile, this is when he's on a diplomatic visit um, to Chile. And what this... Um, what this pamphlet does is um, talk about the abusive treatment you know, that Jose Santos Chocano has received from the Chilean media and the way in which the, um, the Chilean media have treated him so badly. But at the same time, it's a Chilean organization that's denouncing that abusive treatment of him. So again, those t the two stories, encounter and I'm not sure disencounter, lack of connection. Um, now, this particular pamphlet in defense of the so-called socialist poet, José Santos Chocano, finished with the words, Los trabajadores chilenos se honran de tener como huésped a un, a un avanzado representante de los hijos de Atahualpa. Um, 
Now, I think we could do a lot with this language, an advanced representative of the children of Atahualpa and everything that's going on there. Um, what I'm interested in is um, that it, it or how it serves my purposes is it brings us on to Chilean discussions about indigenous Peru. Now, as I've been reading through Aya de la Torre's writings and his letters, I've noted how important conversations with um, how important conversations with Gabriela Mistral seem to be, retrospectively especially, um, to his conception or his ideas about Indo-America and what Indo-America meant. He writes on a number of occasions um, of having talked about these things with her, and he seems to really want to stress that they agreed on what Indo-America was all about. Although I'd actually say there's some major differences between Mistral and Aire La Torre on Indo-America. Um, another conversation about a shared indigenous identity is that between Ciro Alegria and Gabriela Mistral. As we see in letters between them, and as we see in Alegria's um, published memories of Mistral shortly after her death in 1957. In the first, in a, in, um, the let in a letter of 1948 to Gabriela Mistral, um, when they're both, Gabriela Mistral and Ciro Alegria, both living in the United States at this point, um, he talks about him and Gabriela both being paisanos de los, indi uh, de los indies, de los andes. Now, there's a shared Andean identity there. Um, in the second um, passage, he's remembering meeting Gabriela for the first time in Chile in 1937. Gabriela me hizo muchas preguntas acerca de los indios peruanos. Simpatizaba con los mismos y el imperio Tahuantinsuyo. Ella decía tener sangre quechua y estaba a la vista. Recordaba que su región de nacimiento, which is the Bairielki, perteneció al imperio de los incas. Conversando de asuntos indios, estuvimos hasta que nos sentamos a la mesa. Era la nuestra una amistad surgida de la América ancestral. Um, Bernardo Subacaso has described um, the, 19, the period the 1930s through to the 1950s as the Epoca de Oro, or the golden age of publishing in Chile, um, with more publishing houses, more revistas than ever before, publishing larger number of works, and with, a lar with larger print runs than ever before. Now, Aya de la Torre's collection of essays, A Donde Va, Indo America, was published in Santiago in 1935. Three of Ciro Alegria's novels, his first novels, Indigenista novels, were first published in Chile, in Santiago. Now we could say that this merely shows that APRA intellectuals or APRA activists um, were very influential in the publishing world in Chile. Um, and that's why their books get published, not to do with the subject no, or the theme of their books. But I also think it shows, and there was many more Peruvian intellectuals' works writing on indigenous Latin America that were published um, in Chile. I also think that this shows that there was a space for indigenista debate in Chile. I also think it's important to stress that Ciro Alegria wrote what became perhaps the... the Obra Cumbre, no? or the most prominent obra of Peruvian indigenismo, El Mundo es Ancho y Ajeno. He didn't just publish that in Chile, he wrote that while he was in Chile. So he was thinking that through while he was in Chile. Um, now, why is this important? Well, because, as I said before, Chile is rarely discussed in the literature on indigenismo. Now, and I think, I think it should be. Um, it's certainly true that Chile did not have an indigenista movement or anything similar to the indigenista movement of Peru or Mexico. But I would argue that people were talking about indigenous cultures and indigenous rights. In many cases, it was Peruvians in Chile talking about indigenous cultures and indigenous rights, but in dialogue with Chileans. And it was Chilean publishing houses that disseminated their ideas. Now, what the experience of um, the Aprista uh, exile community in Chile shows us is there existed multiple sites you know, that brought together Chileans and Peruvians. What we see, I think, um, is the construction, and partly a construction by Chileans,